Fear stops us from achieving our true greatness. Are you a professional woman who is feeling stuck, unmotivated, or burned out? Are you worried about your wellness? Are you letting fear stop you from crushing your goals? If you answered yes to any or all of these, then this is the podcast for you. Dr. Charmaine Gregory, Night Shift Emergency Physician, Burnout Thriver, and Wellness Champion, along with everyday heroes just like you, will explore how to face fear in our lives and emerge victoriously. Hey, thanks for checking out this episode. Be sure to click the subscribe button and the notification bell so you get notified when the next video comes out. It only takes two seconds to make two clicks. So let's do it. Let's get back to the video. Hello, 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 Fearless Freedom fam. It's Dr. G and I am here with Dr. Minani. She is going to tell you all about what she is up to because she's up to a lot, y'all, and who she is. Dr. Tandy, you want to take it away? Thank you so much for having me here. I am so excited. This is one of my favorite podcasts. You have had, you are amazing, first of all, and I am always impressed and inspired by everything that you do. And you've had some of the most amazing guests on your show. And I, you know, in one of these days, I'm going to get my own podcast too, but you you have led with the light for us all. So thank you, thank you, thank you for having me here. So my name is Dr. Tandi, and I, I'm so excited because I love, I love talking about um, fear. I love talking about emotional mastery. So I have a lot of goodies, but let's just rewind to my journey, which actually well, it started more than 20 years ago, but We'll rewind to September 11th, 2001, almost 20 Oh, wow. Ago. Yeah, I was working for m M&M Mars, the candy company, and I had all the candy in the world and all the friends too, because when you have a lot of candy, you get a lot of friends. <laughs> and 9-11 <laughs> happened. And it was one of those moments I remember I was, um, we were holding hands with the head of HR. And it was one of those moments where I just had a quarter life crisis. And I started to think like, what, what do I want the rest of my life to represent? What do I want to do with the rest of my life? And while m M&M Mars was a great company to work for, great, they, people never left there. Um, I realized that I wanted to serve in a different and greater way. And that's when I decided to go to medical school and so I went to medical school, I became an ophthalmologist, which was really cool. I get to operate on people's eyes. And then I started getting this gnawing feeling like there was something else. There was something else that I was supposed to do. And I wasn't sure what it was. And then one day I decided I'm tired of feeling this way. I'm just going to start throwing things against the wall and seeing what sticks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and one of the eye-opening moments for me, I was working for this woman who had had knee, knee replacement surgery, and she had been invited to speak to a group of low vision people. And she couldn't go because she was in recovery, so she asked me to go in her stead. And so I'm there, and it's funny because when I talk, I'm used to using visual aids and PowerPoints, but when people can't see, you can't use any of that stuff. Right? Oh, wow. Okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. And so I'm in front of this group of people, these low vision people, and I'm encouraging them and I'm connecting them and I'm starting to feel alive and I'm starting to feel this like passion and fire. And I was like, okay, we're, we're on to something there. And so I went on this journey to develop myself as a professional speaker. And on that journey, I um, started writing a book. I ended up getting into coaching. And then I guess the thing in coaching, um, which some people recommend is that you choose a niche. It wasn't my main niche. And in trying to figure out my niche, I, I remember the, the phrase, your purpose is in your pain. Your purpose mm. is in your pain. And I started thinking about all the different painful things, and I've had all different kinds of pain. <laughs> <laughs> like a pain specialist. Oh, no. 
<laughs> like, like money pains, relationship pains. Um, and I was like, well, I think the probably the deepest one, the hardest thing that I um, had to overcome and survive was um, going through the divorce process. And so I became I decided to start to focus on um, helping women recover and heal from divorce and create the life that they wanted to live. Awesome. Wow. That's quite the journey to go from Mars M&M to ophthalmology, to coaching, to helping women reconcile feelings, direction, et cetera after a life-changing event like divorce. Wow. That's quite the journey. <laughs> oh, it's been quite the journey and I have tons of stories to tell. And I, one of the quotes in thinking about fear, um, one of the quotes that came to mind in, in thinking about what is, what, is, what is one of the biggest fears that I've had to overcome in my life Mm -hmm. And I thought about, there's a quote by Joseph Campbell. And in that quote, he says, we must be willing to get rid of the life, to, to get rid of the life we plan as to have the life that is waiting for us. Mm. We must be willing to get rid of the life we plan so as to have the life that is waiting for us. And so many times when we, so often when we get married, we have this vision of what our life will be like. And mm -hmm. um, just in general, whether we're married or not, so often life, things unexpectedly happen in life that derail us and we are forced to go in a different direction. And we can either cling on to what was and be miserable. You've Like you've seen people who I'm sure who something happened to them 20 years ago and they're still yeah, they're still harping on it. It's so like <laughs> never move on. Yeah. Or we yeah. really like embrace um the life that is presented to us. And I think there is there's so much power in that. No, absolutely. Absolutely. It's um, I mean, it is something that's really funny because if you ask yourself, you know, if you talk back to the self that you are maybe even 10 years ago and you say like, you know, um, where do you think you, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Your vision of where you're going to be in 10 years is not usually where you end up, you know? And, and obviously there are some decisions that come into play there. Like, you know, are you going to take bold moves and make big things happen in your life? Or are you going to be more conservative? You know, so your trajectory can be determined by decisions you make, but like, but you can't really have a true plan. You can have like an outline about what you think might happen, but the actual plan, I don't know. That's kind of like when people develop a business plan, right? So they develop a business plan and, you know, they have a, it's, it's really like a guideline or an outline because as you know, when you start a business or you're in business, like the things that you never account for are the things that can derail you or can, you know, completely change the direction of your company or change the direction of your, um, just your principles in business even. And so it's, it's difficult to really like, plan it to a T. So if you're somebody who, you know, has to plan everything out, you know, I'm not that person, but if you're somebody who has to plan everything out, it's hard. It can be hard. It can be hard when life throws you a curveball. Cause you're like, wait a minute. I this is not in my plan. Like, this is what you say. <laughs> it's not in my plan. And you know, but in actuality, the thing that wasn't in your plan is like the best opportunity ever. Right. Cause it's like, okay, you know, you, thought you're going to go to XYZ university. You didn't go there, but then you end up going to someplace else. And that place that you went, you met, you know, your lifelong best friend, you and your best friend went into business together and you had great success or whatever the story is. But I'm just saying like, oftentimes, you know, that quote is realized when we think we have this grand plan for what we're going to have happen in our lives. And then, you know, the universe or God or whoever, whatever, um, basically like, totally tells you no that's not what that's not what's in store for you like let's go this other direction so and usually when you go in the other direction you become a better person you like have experiences that are 
are lasting and it's, you know, it's worth it. So yeah. So I, I know you've had some very interesting pathways, um, which I don't know, maybe you can say whether you felt like they were um, putting you in a better place or putting you in a trajectory that um, makes you a better person. I don't know. I don't know what you're what you'll say about that. But oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. There's a there's a saying that says when we make plans, God laughs. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> right. Because I mean, you said 10 years, I can't even predict 10 days. And um, the interesting thing about life is oftentimes the things that we fear the most don't even happen. And the horrible things that happen, we couldn't see coming. And some of the great things that happen, we couldn't see coming either. Like we, we had no idea, like I had no idea that, um, for instance, in my last year of residency, um, I had this car, I loved this first car I paid for by myself. It was a 98 Honda Civic. I was so proud of the car. And I was like, I'm going to drive this car forever until like, till it falls apart. Unfortunately, it fell apart by senior year. And I was like, oh man. Oh no. It, but I ended up getting it was sort of, it was sort of an indirect um, result of me forgetting my laptop on the plane. I ended up getting the car of my dreams, which at that time was a Lexus convertible, a, a twilight amethyst Lexus convertible with white leather interior. And because nice. I had that car, I was able to go to a conference at Will's Eye Hospital, which is one of the most prestigious hospitals, eye hospitals in America. And because I got to go to that conference, I got to meet the people in charge of my fellowship well what would be my fellowship and I was able to get an interview for that fellowship so if my car hadn't broken down I don't know if the rest of that would happen um and so the the problem with us as human beings is that we're very myopic um, mm -hmm. we're very myopic we're very nearsighted in what we can see we can only see but so far we can't we, we don't know what we don't we don't even know what we don't know Whereas God has a much greater plan and a greater perspective. And so sometimes that thing that you think is, is what you absolutely need um, or that you thought was absolutely horrendous, that's actually the thing that you need that will propel you to the next level. And one of my founding beliefs is that everything happens for my good. The universe mm -hmm. is firing in my favor. Mm -hmm. And it, I think it's just a, a matter of perspective, how we see, how we see life, how we choose to look at the world. And of course, that's not to say that certain things don't suck and certain things aren't horrible and certain things don't feel like crap. We all, we all get a piece of crap pine. Nobody gets off of this earth <laughs> without one. Um, but it's not one of the, the biggest lessons that I've learned is the importance of learning to respond to life and not react. It's so easy to be reactionary, but it takes intention and purpose and direction to respond. And just because something happens to you doesn't mean that you have to become a victim. Um, that, that's a choice. Being a victim, choosing powerlessness is a choice. Choosing Just like choosing um, faith, or choosing fear, those are both a choice. Um, and when um, you choose to live in fear, I mean, it's it's not a good it's not a good feeling. You've got your sympathetic system firing up. You're in a stress state. That's really hard. And really, both faith and fear take an element of belief, right? Fear is believing that the negative will happen, whereas right. faith is believing that the positive will happen. And so we can we can choose at, at every given moment what how will we respond to this situation given what is what am I going to create in this moment? What good can I find? Absolutely, no, you are absolutely right, and that's perfectly put. You know, it's like we tend not to focus on the positive things that the universe can send our way. 
<laughs> particularly when we're in a negative situation. Like, as you said, what did you call it? Something, what was a pie? What kind of pie was it? Crap pie. <laughs> Crap pie. Yes, I love that. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. So you kind of mentioned in passing a few things that I would love for you to talk more about. So you mentioned that you do coaching. You also mentioned that you wrote a book. Um, you did mention that you wrote a book, right? I thought I heard that. I did. I did. It's okay. not, not out yet. It's coming out. Oh, okay. That's why I was like, why is she not talking about her book coming out? <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Okay. So then let's... Um, Let's have you talk about the coaching and who you offer to. I mean, like in general, you said that you help assist women who are going through divorce, correct? Yes. Who, yes. So I, at this moment, I'm pretty much working on two different things. Um, okay. One, working with hospitals to create um, wellness programs for physicians. And then yeah. two, um, working with um, uh, female doctors who are either in the process of going through a divorce, contemplating divorce, or who have gone through a divorce to help to empower them to heal faster and create a new future. Okay. And then in both of those modalities, is there a way for people to reach out to you? Like, so if there's somebody listening right now who wants to hire you to come into their institution and provide the council for the wellness programs, or if there is a physician who is going through divorce or about to go through divorce, who is seeking assistance with that um, from the emotional standpoint, how can they reach you? Oh, absolutely. I actually, I, I was working on conquering one of my fears today, which is technology. I mean, in the past, I had been absolutely terrified of technology. So I created a landing page just for your listeners. Um, they can reach out to me. They can get a um, copy of my mini course called Embrace Your Fear and Do It Anyway. And awesome. the link for that is bit.ly slash idoc embrace fear. I is E Y E doc D O C embrace fear. Awesome. So that's awesome. That's bit.ly uh, forward slash idoc embrace fear. Awesome. So, and that's B as in boy, right? Yeah. Okay, B cool. Because sometimes B sounds like V. That's why. Awesome. 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 All right. So great. So it's going to make sure that they had a way to contact you because it'll be in the show notes, but sometimes, well, I should say most times when I'm listening to podcasts, for example, I'm out and about, I'm not necessarily like in a place where I can see the show notes. So it's always good to have it, you know, said so that you can have the information while you're on the go. So awesome. Thank you for, for letting us know that, that piece of things. And so tell us now, um, so you talked about, you know, all of these amazing things that happened that led you in a very positive direction. Do you wish to tell us a little bit more about how is it that you got into um, coaching? Like what, the, what led you there? Because there had to be some fear that was conquered in order for you to get into that space. Actually, the coaching came about when I, after I watched the, the Netflix documentary by Tony Robbins, uh, that, what's it called? I forget. He has the Netflix document. Oh, I'm not your guru. I'm not your guru. Okay. And in that um, documentary, he, uh, they go over some of the transformations that happen at his six, six day program called date with destiny. And I just thought, wow, this is, this is amazing. He, you know, people in the period of six days, um, people's lives are changed. I try to, you know, some people I've been working with for six years and I still can't get them to take their eye drops or follow up with appointments. Right? And I, and I just became fascinated about with, um, the idea of how do we get people, how do we create change in people? How do we transform lives? How do we take a person from point A and get them to the point B? Um, so that's how, how, how coaching came about. 
it, oh, it's sort wow. of thing like a natural extension to, to, to speaking, right? Because when you speak, you're just, it's all going one way. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and whether people implement what you say, whether people forget it within an hour, you have no idea. But when you're coaching people and working with them, when I'm coaching with and working with them individually, um, then I actually get to see the change, which is really exciting. It's really exciting. I'm really excited when people conquer their fears. I'm really excited when people go from um, miserable or stuck or confused to um, empowered and taking action. So yeah. that is great. That's great. Hey, it's Dr. G. And I just wanted to take a quick moment to thank you for listening to this episode. I'm so honored to have you here with me. Did you know that I can help you to get your own podcast started? With my podcasting launch course for professionals, I walk you through everything you need to know about starting a podcast. I'm with you every step of the way from sign up to launching your show with five episodes ready to go. There's a done for you version that's also available. If you would just rather just do recordings and leave the behind the scenes work up to us, then that one is definitely for you. But either way, we've got your back here at Fearless Freedom with Dr. G. Oh, if you already have a show and you need production services, we have monthly plans available for you. So check out the links in the episode show notes for more information. Let's get back to the show. And then, so do you do, so you mentioned the mini course that is offering on your, um, on your site. Um, so do you do mostly group coaching or is it individual basis or are there kind of tiers to what you offer? I actually don't do group coaching at this time because a lot of times the things that um, I'm talking about with people are very deeply personal, you know, like my husband had an affair, my husband, like they, these are things that people are not necessarily wanting to talk to a whole bunch of strangers sure, about. Sure. So um, at the moment, I just offer individual coaching, which okay. I think is um, nice because there's so many like automated and online um, programs where you're in a group there's not I feel like there's fewer and fewer offerings where um, you're actually working one-on-one -on directly with the person cool not as neat and then um, and then how are you like how how has it been with the institutionals uh, situations like so when you're going into the hospital and you're giving them advice about wellness, how has that been for you? This is a new, this is a new endeavor, but the, the argument is that is, there's a number of arguments for it. Number one, the cost to recruit a new doctor, it costs the hospital a lot of money. So it's to invest a little bit of money to help increase the happiness and joy in patients makes sense. Additionally, as you know, I know you, you talk a lot about burnout and compassion fatigue. When doctors are not well, the outcomes for patients suffer. Um, and yes. so it is in their best interest to um, do whatever they can to, to help, their find, help their staff find ways to stay happy and healthy and well. So here's a corollary to that. Are you finding that they are willing or um, even able to make the institutional changes that are required to ensure that outcome that you described? Well, I don't try to change institutions because I, I don't. Um, I feel like that's beyond my um, powers at this time. What I do is um, try to help equip individuals with tools of surviving and thriving in challenging situations. Gotcha. Okay. All right. So that's clear for you. But ideally, ideally the hospitals would change, but that, that takes a lot. Yeah, it does. And, and so this is the reason why I asked that question is because, um, 
as somebody who lived through burnout um, and also kind of looked into it a little bit more afterward and, you know, the whole, the whole, uh, you know, concept where unfortunately the individual gets blamed for burning out, you know, the physician gets blamed for burning out. Like you could do something different. You could be better. Like you've made it through, you know, all these difficult situations. And why is it that you're not able to be resilient in this particular situation? But then, you know, you have places like um, Stanford who've really, you know, dug into this whole paradigm and realized that it's not just individual, right? Like, it's like, a, it's a fluid thing. It's like the ease of practice. So the things that are obstacles in your way as you are trying to provide the best care possible to your patients, you know, those things can be detrimental um, the culture of wellness in an institution. So like, you know, what is this, what is the, what is the, uh, what is the ethos of the organization? Like if we lose a patient or we have a bad outcome, what do we do then? Do we pull the team together? Do we do a debriefing? Do we make sure everybody has an opportunity to, you know, have a moment of silence for the patient? Do we make sure each person has an opportunity on the team to express what they think about the situation, how can we be better the next time? And then is there a way for them to get counseling afterward? Because, you know, these are all things that play into why we get to the point where we get burned out. Like these are all the things, right? So, you know, um, the final piece is, is the personal resilience, but like, you know, if we do things like we teach ourselves or we instruct our colleagues how to be resilient but then the institution's culture of wellness is still malignant and the ease of practice is not fixed then it's a, it's a moot point you know what I mean so that's why I was asking that question because like I don't think most institutions think about that like they do focus on you know having programs that will mentally prepare the physicians but they don't focus on the thing that brings them to that place that requires that to begin with. So it's, it's hard. It's hard going in as a wellness advocate because you really have to address some of those other things, even though, you know, you may, you may, you may be coming up against like a stone wall, you know, you may be coming up against a brick wall, maybe, and it may be difficult to do this, but it's like, it's almost like you have to also be a catalyst from within, I guess, to have them see this, right? So it's like you have to somehow point it out to them that this is also necessary. So that's yeah. why I, I asked that question because I, just, I have seen it, right? I've seen what it does and I've been through it. And so I kind of like understand why, um, why it's important to not neglect the other two prongs of the wheel because they're very interconnected, you know, oh, because you, yeah, because you fix the doctor, but then they're still in the same situation and it, it doesn't, it's not a lasting fix. No, absolutely. I, I absolutely believe that there needs to be institutional change. And if you have ideas on how we can get that to happen, I'm more than happy to listen. But yes, absolutely. It's, it's not, it's not. So the responsibility for change does not lie solely on the individual. However, sometimes in life, we find ourselves in situations. And while we might be able to change something on the long term, we have to be able to figure out how to survive and thrive right here, right now, because change, absolutely. change absolutely. Um, it takes time. But absolutely, I, I think that we do. I think one of the problems with medicine is that in general, we just have this culture where um, doctors are not supposed to be human, right? And when I was a third year medical student, what, what was I told? Eat when you can, pee when you can, sleep when you can. How is eating, peeing, and sleeping, how is that an optional thing? <laughs> like those are basic, those are basic human needs. And we, you know, we we become so used to 
neglecting ourselves, neglecting our bodily urges, neglecting our feelings that we're yet there oftentimes like when I was a medical student, there was never a space to mourn over a dead um, a patient who had died or a an opportunity to talk about how difficult it is to have these end of life conversations with families. It was just something you're supposed to just do and keep on moving. And if you were sick or whatever, you better come, you better come into work unless you're in the hospital on a ventilator. Like there, there was just not, um, we have this culture of sort of ignoring and pretending that things don't happen. But the problem is that if you ignore these things for long enough, they end up being quite detrimental, not just for us as physicians, but for the whole system. The whole system oh, starts absolutely. to fall apart. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you got told the same thing I got told. Interesting. <laughs> what, you, <laughs> right. I mean, like if you like, it, they like, tell that to everybody, don't they? That's crazy. <laughs> all, the, all the med students, they tell that too, huh? <laughs> like what? I'm not supposed to eat? What? Like. Oh, yeah. Animals? Yeah. Like, and, and so even like now um we're go as we go through this pandemic um one of the i'm doing this series on um, my facebook page um which has become like my pseudo blog called 100 days of grieving because really the world is in grief the world is grieving right now we all have lost we've lost a way of life a lot of people have lost loved ones a lot of people have lost jobs we're dealing with a lot a lot of loss and uncertainty and like nobody's talking about it yeah nobody's yeah. talking about it and, and physicians are experiencing compassion fatigue depression burnout anxiety and um, we need more spaces where we can where we can talk about it and overcome those things. No, absolutely. It's uh, you know, it was uh, it was very present before, but it, it, I think last year this this whole this whole crisis that we've been involved in has uh, basically unroofed a lot of underlying trauma. Um, you know, suppressed feelings, et cetera, et cetera. And it has truly revealed the, I don't want to say chinks in the armor because it's more than a chink. It's like the, uh, the cancer. huge, the huge cancer that's in our, in our profession. And, uh, you know, it just really shows like, you know, and, 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 and the thing that I think is also very fascinating, and I'm not trying to bring up something political, but like, you know, and people always say that I'm not trying to do this, but I, then they actually do it. But <laughs> no, I'm really not bringing up something political, but I'm just, I just wanted to like point something out. You know, it's like, you know, we look at how, how the healthcare force, you know, was treated last year. Like, oh, you guys are heroes. This is great. You know, you're putting your life on a line to, you know, because there was nothing really available then like in the, in the, in the height of things. So like March, April, May, like all of that time when it was just crazy, we had ICUs full and we had like, you know, whole wings of the hospital just converted to COVID COVID um, care. And, you know, it was just nuts. It was absolutely nuts. And you would go into your shift and you would literally be like, okay, am I, is this the day I'm going to bring COVID home to my family? Like, is this, you know, like, this is the thing that you'd be thinking about, right? And you would just be like, you would be thankful that, you know, those months when in the beginning, when you didn't know, when you didn't know that people who came with appendicitis really had COVID and you got exposed to them, you're up in their face, like, you know, all these things. And you're like, oh, you know, you, you, you have these rituals where you scrub down yourself, you scrub down your belongings, you leave your stuff outside because you just were so hyper vigilant about not wanting to harm your family. And it's just like an additional stress, right? So you already have the stress of people's lives in your hands. And then you have the, and then making quick decisions with little information. At least I'm talking from an emergency medicine perspective, right? So, you know, you, you live in a world where it's like high risk, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of like low, no data and big decision making that, you know, is, is necessary. And so you have that stress and you, you, you're kind of used to that stress and you're kind of like, okay, great. But then you have this new stress, which is, oh my God, uh, 
I could get sick at any moment. I can get my whole family sick. Somebody in my family could be laying in this bed. Somebody in my family or even myself could be intubated. You're watching colleagues die, like literally other doctors, you're seeing them die. You're seeing like all of this carnage and the public is like, oh, you're a hero, blah, blah, blah. And then the vaccine comes out and you're like, oh, praise the Lord. You know, if you believe in God, you're like, oh, you know, this is awesome. You know, we're going to have a tool now that we can actually fight in the battle. We're not going into the battle with bare hands and being faced with like, you know, nuclear weapons. And so then, you know, you're thinking, yay, everybody's going to go out and do this thing. Everybody's going to get it. Yeah. You volunteer your arm. You're like, boom, here's my arm. Take it, you know, stick it as many times as you need to let's, let's do this. But you're not seeing that same fervor and that same response from the same public that was like, you guys are heroes. Yay. You, <laughs> you like risked your life and the lives of your family to take care of me. And it's like a total like slap in the face when there is this whole thing about, oh, I don't know about this thing that's going to actually help me to not get the disease as badly as I could get it if I get exposed and potentially die. I've seen hundreds of thousands of people die, but I still don't believe that this thing can help. Yeah. So that, that right there is like, one of the big things that this makes me um, pause and just think like, oh my God, like this is just like unbelievable that we are here, that this is happening. And, you know, I, this is not to like, this is, I mean, this is obviously a subset of the population. And uh, I am like super grateful for everybody who is like, yes, here's my arm, you know, unless they have some contraindication for getting the vaccine, which I totally get. But like, if they're eligible and they can do it and they're like, yes, let's do it. Those are the people who are winning right now, right? Because those are the ones that even if they get COVID, they're not like sucking air and like requiring like intubation and like long-term care or, you know, dying essentially. And so it's just nuts. It's just nuts. And then, and then I'm like, I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm like, I'm going off here, but like, I'm like, so like ticked about this <laughs> because now, so I'm in Guam and we were doing fantastic. We were doing so well. Everybody mm. here was doing everything they're supposed to do, like social distancing and wearing a mask, taking temperature before you go into the store. If you have a temperature, you don't go in. Like people were actually doing their civic duty and they were like so good, right? And we were to the point where we had like two cases a week and that was a big week. We we're like, what, two cases? And now it's like the floodgates have opened. And it is so disheartening because yeah. we are still doing what we're supposed to do. But guess what? People came on the island that weren't vaccinated, brought COVID with them, right? And then it just like went rampant through, guess what population? Our kids who can't get vaccinated. And it's just like, yeah. really? Really? Is this what's happening? This is what's happening right now? Like you made a choice. You chose to not like protect yourself, right? And then you made a choice for other people who couldn't, couldn't have that opportunity. And it's just so disappointing, so disappointing. So anyway, I'm sorry. I went off on a little rant No, there. no apologies. But, no but, but, apologies. This is, but, this is, but this is like what I was thinking today because I was just like, oh, you know, I just, you know, the kids don't, they don't need that. I mean, thank God that we haven't had like, a really bad case of, you know, MIS or one of these other things that the kids get, but like, you know, it's still ridiculous. Like they shouldn't be having this problem, right? They shouldn't be going through that. They shouldn't be at risk of potentially dying. Like they shouldn't have that. Like that's not what children should experience. And, I, you know, we as adults should protect them and we're, we're not, we didn't do a good job and, and that just is not cool. So yeah. anyway. It's not, it's not, but you know, I think it's so important that the public hears this and hears your perspective. And I completely take my hat off to all of you uh, physicians who are on the front line, who are seeing these people in the ER, who are um, 
the anesthesiologist, the ER docs, the primary care docs, because the you know in ophthalmology we're somewhat removed, um, somewhat although you know we still, but people aren't coming to us um, for with um, for COVID diagnosis at least or with things like that. But I mean, I like the horror stories that I've heard from other ER docs even at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, doctors were um, being threatened to um, to be fired by administrators for wearing masks. Oh, yes. For wearing masks. Yeah. <laughs> wearing I mean, masks. I personally experienced that, but I definitely know of a colleague that did experience that. Yeah. And if you were PPE, I, you were, you know, ostracized. And, the, and there's so much trauma. That, I mean, that's a really traumatic experience from having to go home every day and and not know if this is the day you're going to make your family sick. This is the day you're going to die. That's a lot. To um, and and it, interestingly, I I have a friend who's very well educated who adamantly refuses to get vaccinated. And really, what most of that is about is around fear, right? And there's a lot of there's so much propaganda around these vaccines that's really um, providing a disservice to the public, um, because as you know, when people um, are not vaccinated, they're, they come, they get more severe illness and, and die. Yes, <laughs> Many times. yes. Um, and by then it's like, it's too late, but it's almost like people are holding like a playing Russian roulette and they say, well, maybe if I get it, I'll be one of the the mild ones, but there's nothing to guarantee There's no that. guarantee, no guarantee. No guarantee. And, and um, once, if you happen to be one of the people that gets the severe case, it's too late for the vaccine at that point. It's yes. too late. Or if you happen to um, make someone else in your family who is um, susceptible, if you happen to get them sick, you know, that, you know, that's a huge burden to bear. And um, it's, it's been really, it's been really tough. It's been really tough for physicians. It's been really tough for the public. It's just been a really tough time. Um, and I think part of what what has to happen is people, you know, we, we choose, you're either going to fear the vaccine or fear the virus, given that we have evidence that the virus has already killed millions of people. Yes. Um, if you're going to fear one, I would say make that the bigger fear. Right, right, right. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I do get that it's fear. Um, yeah, but I just, I just don't understand it, <laughs> you know, and, and, and I guess that would be, I guess it's just because of what I see, you know, what I'm seeing. I think that is the, it's real to me. Like maybe it's not real to people who are in that particular, take that particular stance, it, it's probably not real to them. Like they don't know anybody maybe, or they, um, yeah, they probably just don't know anybody, but it's like, it just takes one. And yeah, it's just, I, I just don't understand it. It's mind blowing. And, and I think that like a lot of us just don't understand. We just don't get it. Right. I mean, but. there's a big difference between seeing someone die um versus hearing about someone dying right that's, that's true <laughs> yeah it's not real to you it's just not real yeah, it's like it's oh not. yeah that's that person over there but when they're in front of you and you did everything you could and they're gone and then it happens time after time after time after time then it's like okay wait <laughs> what is going on here you know it's like it's like we can't ever truly relate to a soldier that's been deployed to war. Like we can't, unless you're a soldier that's been deployed to war and you had to actually see your colleagues die or you had to actually fire the weapon that killed somebody else. Like that's not real to you, right? right. I mean, it's, I think it's, it's very similar to that, right? Because like yeah. I can't fully relate. I mean, I can, I can, you know, my, my friends that are in the military who have been deployed, I can only say, you know, thank you because I don't, I don't know what they go through. I can't imagine that. Right. So, you know, but it's, but it's, I, I never will say like, um, I won't say anything like disparaging about what they do because I know what they do is important and they're protecting us and our, our way of life. Right. So it's just ironic that this is a war of sorts 
and you know the 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 soldiers are providing you with a tool and you are scuffing the war experience and the the war like the carnage that war brings to just choose not to participate or choose not to get involved and then go as far as to like disparage the whole process disparage all of the work that's been put in all the sacrifice has been made you know so yeah it's just just wild yeah but, it is wild. You know, but but you like you said it i mean i think it probably really is fair right i mean but people just don't really know how to deal with it in a constructive way so they just don't which is harmful <laughs> it is it is right fear um i mean fear fear can be lethal <laughs> right failure to act because fear can be lethal can be deadly absolutely yeah absolutely. did you know i'm in the military i do know that you yeah did. i didn't know if you were yeah, deployed I ever but i, 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 I knew you were in, i knew you were in the military I, I haven't been to a war zone, but I have I have obviously uh, friends that I have, and I I hear about it, but I can't even imagine what it's like to be like trying to you know do CPR on your friends who were dying left. I mean, the PTSD is real. It is real. Yes, yes, yes. Um, indeed, indeed. And if you guys see someone in the airport or around town wearing a uniform just go up and say thank you if they're at a restaurant buy them their lunch that means that the little gestures like that it can make such a difference <laughs> oh i believe it i believe it yeah we live on a military island so it's like we have military all around us so yeah no definitely 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 that's uh that's very important very very important awesome oh my gosh we've been chatting for a while so you know what <laughs> <laughs> we should probably wrap it up. Wrap it up. <laughs> so do you um do you mind just telling the tribe one more time the landing page information so they can know how to reach out to you? Uh, sure. My landing page is B I T B is in Bravo, I T is in Tango dot L Y forward slash I doc embrace fear. Uh, B I T L Y forward slash I doc E Y E doc D O C embrace fear. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I have, awesome. I have the answers for your questions. Oh, yay. The okay. Questions. Yeah, you ready? You ready? We're about to I'm do it. Ready. Yeah, okay, I'm ready. Here it goes. Go. She like jumped the gun. Check that out, tribe. Um, yeah, so, yeah. So, we're going to do like, our tradition, oh. which is fill in the blanks. So, here we go. Here we go. The first one <laughs> is. To me, fearless freedom means. To me, fearless freedom means choosing faith over fear. Awesome, 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 awesome. And then the next one is, if I am fearless, I will. If I am fearless, I will get comfortable with being uncomfortable and keep my intended end in sight. Love it, love it. And then last but not least, my battle cry is. Oh, this is my favorite one. <laughs> Come what may, we will slay. Oh, I love that one. That's good. <laughs> awesome, 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 awesome. Well, Dr. Tandy, thank you so much for taking time out and spending it with us here at the Fearless Freedom Tribe. We really appreciate you. And uh, we got into a deep conversation here, girl. That was fantastic. So um, yes, 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 yes. We, we appreciate you. Thank you for everything that you do. Thanks for your service. Thanks for everything. Thank you. Thank you for um, helping, helping us and encouraging us and inspiring us to embrace and overcome our fears and teaching us all the most awesome podcast out there. So thank you. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Fearless Freedom with Dr. G. Again, I'm Dr. G. And if you like this episode, be sure to subscribe so that you can get notified of when the next episode is going to be. And also, I'll catch you next time. Have a great one. Be strong, be brave, and unleash your greatness.